Well hey gang, let's get through a couple of smaller jobs today. I'm going to start off with this instrument here. This is a custom or handmade guitar, I'm told. It was built by an Meep. Apparently worked with George Ferlinetto over at F Bases 20 or 25 years ago. So he was a local. Don't know where he is or haven't seen anything from him before. This is in for a setup, but to be honest I'm going to spend a lot of time cleaning it because it's really filthy. The owner has woodworking experience and he did a repair on the broken headstock here using epoxy. But he'd like me to see if I can hide his tracks a little bit with some finish touch-up. You guys know I try and stay away from little finish touch-ups unless it's part of a much bigger repair. Um, people will call me up and they'll say, I've got a scratch on my Les Paul. And I'm like, yep, that'll happen. So unless you're going to treat it like a classical player, at least some of them, Keep it in the case. Never ever put it on a stand. Don't wear a belt buckle. Don't have a zipper on your hoodie. Keep your forearm in a sleeve every time you play it. It's going to get dinged. It's going to wear. It's That's normal. Scratches are normal. The problem is, the people who can't accept a little scratch on their guitar, they're the ones, you know, you'll spend hours agonizing over it, trying to make it look decent, and they're the ones that, well, ooh, I can still see it there. And it's like, yes, yes. There's no way for us to turn back time to a period before you damaged your guitar. So, it's really hard to get paid enough to make it worthwhile in a lot of cases. This time, this is minor enough. I've already got some paint mixed up for another job that should be close. So, you know, we'll do that. Apparently it has not been played very much in those intervening 20 years. And I believe it. Those are probably the original strings. And that is just filthy. Um... I want to take the bar off, but I can't because it keeps running into the top here. And no, I'm going to have to loosen the springs on the inside before I try and take that off. I better plug it in to make sure it creates sound. So I have a quick look inside here. Oh yeah. I'm scrubbing through the worst of it with some naphtha. Even got a toothbrush out to help in the endeavor. See if we can make things shine. I actually had to use fine polishing compound to cut through the coating that was on the top surface there. It was really it was a film of grease or something. See the before and the after. After cleaning and scuff sanding the area that needs to be repaired, I did some light pore filling over the uh, bare surface of the wood, which is walnut, and also along the line of the crack using some thin super glue. Yeah. Don't glue the headstock cover to the guitar. Yeah, that's um that's what you want to see, right? That truss rod nut is well and truly and probably forever ensconced in that nice bath of super hard epoxy. You know, the neck is going to be what the neck's going to be. We'll set it up as good as it can be set up, but didn't bargain on that. No, I'm not laughing at the person who did the work, you know. It's unfortunate, but if you can't laugh when you're in a guitar shop, you will not make it very long as a repair person. I'm going to thin down some lacquer to spray on this. The actual color of the guitar is a sort of mysterious brownish black, but it's also got something that looks like a very, very fine gold flake in it too. Uh, I'm not going to be able to match it perfectly, but I've got a brownish black that will be pretty good and it'll work for this situation. Got the airbrush out, going to spray on two coats of color and two coats of clear. Okay, up next we have a tenor banjo from the Premier Company. 
So of indeterminate age, 30s, 40s, 50s, who knows. It's got a skin head. The pot's a little bit deformed at this point, and you can see that the head has been pulled down farther on the neck side of the body than on the tail. That can be difficult to correct at this stage. Single dowel tension rod. Hey, checking the action here uh, at the 12th fret. Some people measure at the body. I always just do the 12th fret. Even missing one of its four strings is uh, just around 10 sixty fourths. I'd much prefer to see six. And the bridge is virtually non-existent. New ones they usually have a 5 8 inch bridge. Some of the old ones, half inch is typical. This guy here is just over a quarter of an inch. So, nothing there. So we're going to have to tilt the neck back to lower the action and hopefully make a standard bridge work. Looking at the square dowel here, it's got a simple screw at the tail end. We might be able to snug that up enough to bring the walls of the pot together a bit and bring back some of that neck angle. On the neck side, you can see there's a little bracket here with a screw that goes through it that bears against a metal plate on top of the dowel. And it also has these diagonal slots that engage with a pin that goes through it. Now, the assumption when you see this is that it's going to act like a neck tilt adjuster. You screw it in and it's just going to raise the neck up in its mortise or something. In this case, it's really nothing more than a wedge, just holding tension to keep the dowel and the pot together. If you try and screw it in too tight, you're just going to end up stripping out the threads. Um, there are other old banjos, like uh, the Premiers, it's one brand I've worked on, that has something similar, but it's on the far end of the stick. Uh, it's a little L bracket screwed to the pot, and the screw that goes through there acts like a lever, pushing the rod up and down. So we're just going to try and make this play acceptably. And again, I'm not a banjo expert. People sometimes ask to see banjos in the comments, but you have to realize I don't live in an area with a big thriving banjo culture. This isn't Louisville, so I don't see all that many master tones around here. Usually there's someone's third or fourth instrument, something inexpensive they've picked up to add a little bit of flavor to the repertoire. So I'm just going to do my best on this one. Got the tailpiece removed here, and it's held in place using uh, one of these tensioning nuts. I have to remove that before I can access the one that holds on the rod. If you get involved with banjo repair, there's an awful lot of this. Just hours of turning little nuts and screws. You can see how much that's deformed over the years. We'll loosen this off. You can see that there is a step that's milled into the end of the neck here to accept the hoop and the bead around the end of the, um, the head here. Now, in this case it was up flush against that bead. Um, it can't go any higher. So unless we cut the channel a little bit deeper or reposition this head so that that bead is up higher, and again, on this side of the pot, the hoop was pulled down tighter. It's lower here. You know, in a, a newer banjo, we might get away with it, but I, you know, the idea of trying to reposition this head, um, given its age, I don't know if we would get away with it. It's pretty old. With everything undone, I was still struggling to remove the neck from the pot. It was very confusing. That's frustrating. I bet you the threaded rod there at the end has bent over the years due to pressure on it, or the pot itself has warped so much that it has dug into the side of the hole. The hole was not very much bigger than the, the rod, obviously. And I might have to pound it out, which is something that strikes fear in my heart. 
maybe a wedge. How can it be this tight? I guess there was no way around it. At some point today I was going to have to be excavating around a captured screw, be it banjo or truss rod. I decided to carefully drill it out using a plug cutter. The hoop was just too low, I realized I had to do it, so I loosened all the tension brackets and tapped away at it. And it came up just fine, actually. There was a little step left over from where they milled the end of the neck, so I decided to carefully pare that down so that it would be flush with the top of the dowel stick there. That would give us a little bit more clearance and I could raise the neck up another, oh, sixteenth or three thirty seconds of an inch. I made a plug for the previous screw hole and glued that in and paired it flush and uh, drilled a new hole slightly higher up the body. So I reinstalled the neck in its new higher position there and as I was putting on that wedge bracket I realized the screw had to go in further but it was being prevented because it was in fact very badly stripped out. Uh, I had one that would work but it was much too long so I knew I would have to shorten it. And similarly, the bracket screw on the end that holds on the tailpiece, the nut just wouldn't pass through that um, bent portion, so out came the Dremel. The fret ends were protruding and pretty sharp, so I cleaned those up. And the top surface of the frets had been filed, but never smoothed down. So, you know, I cleaned those up as well, put tape on the board, but I realized that some of the paint was going to come off. Uh, I could live with that because uh, as I was cleaning it, so did the Sharpie that had been used to touch up the, the playware. I dyed everything with Black India ink, which is much nicer. It's a better looking color. I've dealt with this one before. This is one of the worst tailpiece designs of all time. It's listed as patent pending. It's one patent that never should have been granted. Despite the play wear on this instrument, these nut slots are way high. With everything snugged up and the neck raised to its highest possible elevation, it's standing proud of the surface of the head by about an eighth of an inch here. Uh, still working with the old bridge, this low one, we're nowhere near good. We're still above eight and a half sixty fourths, and uh, it's very unfocused sounding. There just isn't enough downward pressure on this bridge. It's very discouraging. Um, this pot has deformed over time. It's folded in on itself, so the top rim is moved, pushed inwards and the bottom is moved outwards, which is the exact opposite to what we need in this situation. Uh, thinking about it, there is at the end of the dowel rod a little washer between it and the side of the pot. I might have to shorten the screw a little bit, but Perhaps if we do that, we can get enough pressure, just remove that washer, get enough pressure on that to sort of pull things inwards a little bit. It's not located in the, the best spot for this because it's like right in the midpoint of the pot. Um, we'll see what it does. I suppose the other thing one could do if one had lots of time and money is come up with a coordinator rod sort of system with a turnbuckle that would um, be closer to the back edge of the pot. Turn that up and tighten it. Um, the other thing that we can do is put a couple of little shims down between the uh, end of the neck and the surface of the pot up here. Uh, try to kick it back a little bit. Doing an actual neck reset on this, you know, cutting and scribing things, that's probably more than we have in the budget for this one. I'm kind of running out of my time. So, you know, I'll do these methods and then we'll see where we're at. We might not be able to use the standard bridge on this thing at all. Okay, with the washer removed, we're down 
kind of respectable um, on the low bridge. Not great, but sort of what you would expect to find in a banjo of this vintage and this condition. So um, I think I should try it in shim and see what happens then. Maybe we can kick this back a little further. I'm cutting some birch veneer that's about a sixteenth of an inch thick. And I'm installing that actually between the tone ring and the end of the neck. Okay, so that's actually perfect for the low bridge. Um, it sounds okay, it doesn't sound great. I'm going to see if I can put a second piece of veneer in there, kick it back a little further, see what happens, and I'll make a bridge that is taller than this one. It, maybe it's not going to be full standard height, but I want a bit more break angle and uh, see if we can get a little bit more sound out of it. Ugh. Have I mentioned how much I hate the restringing process with this thing? Alright, with that second shim, the strings are sitting right on top of the frets. So that means if I make the bridge about 5 30 seconds of an inch taller than this one here, we'll be right about where we want to be, I think. You can see why you're going to want two sets of strings if you're going to do a setup on one of these, uh, especially with this tailpiece, and if you remove the neck five or six times. That's not going to intonate very well. Okay. The tuners on this thing are really, really bad. Old friction tuners. There's nothing like them. Um, the owner has ordered some new ones. They'll take a little time to come in. So this is as far as I'm going to go with this one today. It's back in one piece. The action is nice. It's playable. Probably plays better than at any point in its history, to be honest. Let's jump forward three days briefly here as I do a quick little wet sanding with 1200 grit sandpaper and then I will polish up the finish repair using auto body compounds. With the truss rod stuck where it is, we're just getting away with it. It's around 14 thousandths worth of relief, which is, eh, it's okay. Trying to do setups on kit guitars or hobbyist projects, it's always a can of worms. It's the little stuff. It sort of nickels and dimes you to death. Like in this case, I can't lower the bridge pickup enough so that when you're playing in the upper register, the strings aren't contacting it. Because the spring on the pickup was cut too short. There's not enough adjustment on there. So I'm going to have to take everything out again, put a longer spring in. Pickups are out of phase with each other. Up next we've got a concert quality classical guitar. This is a double top from a very reputable maker. And the new owner received it just over a week ago. And it's got some buzzing issues going on. Specifically when playing rest strokes on the fifth string here. fret is fine, 6th fret there's a lisp, 7, 8, 9, 10 it starts to disappear, 11 it's almost gone, 12 is fine. So I've been asked to do a little assessment here. This guitar came with two different saddles and the owner switched them um, assuming that maybe the buzz was coming from the saddle, but no. Um, action seems reasonable. I'm going to check out the neck relief here. I've got a straight edge right on top of the frets. And we're around eight or nine thousandths in the center of the board. So there's some relief there. Should be okay. So, like I just told the customer, I think this might require more than simple spot dressing. 
as the problem is pervasive over a number of strings and in different locations on the fingerboard. Probably the best thing to do would be to put it on the neck jig, hold it under simulated tension, and then we'll level and recrown the whole board at once. But that's a big expensive job on an absolutely brand new guitar. And really it's still under warranty as far as I'm concerned. Um, classical guitars do tend to be very temperamental at the beginning of their lives. And this is one of the frustrating things that happens when the maker is a great distance away. Adjustments like this get very expensive when shipping is involved, so I need to make sure the player and the builder are on the same page with what's going to happen to this thing before I touch it. And um, so, we'll call it a day. There you have it. Uh, being a repair person can sometimes mean working on vastly different instruments on the same day. There's always a surprise or two. Anyway, thanks for watching. I'll see you again soon.